Okay guys, in this video we are going to be talking about the properties of gases. In particular, we're going to focus on perfect gases. And so I want you to recall from our uh, previous video, uh, the prologue, where we stated that thermodynamic states are defined in terms of their uh, physical, physical properties namely pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. Uh, we're going to talk about these variables uh, as we go. So the first variable we'll, we'll look at the number of moles. Uh, as you know, that represents the amount of a substance. And there are different uh, ways of expressing the amount of substance. So there's, there's the mole. Uh, but you could also just directly count the number of molecules that you have. And so that's what this symbol capital N will represent in my lecture notes. N refers to the total number of molecules, N is the total number of moles, and N subscript A, that's the Avogadro constant, which converts between number of moles and number of molecules. And as you know, it has the value of 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules per mole. Another way of expressing the amount of substance uh, is in terms of the mass, uh, and I'll be using a lowercase m, uh, and the SI unit of mass is the kilogram. Okay? And so it's, it's an equivalent way of expressing the amount of, of matter that you have. Uh, to convert between moles and mass, we use what's called the molar mass and I'm using the symbol capital M here to denote the molar mass, your SI units would actually be kilograms per mole, uh, but as you know, more commonly we use grams per mole when expressing molar masses. And to convert, um, you know, between mass and number of moles, this is the definition of molar mass. Molar mass is the mass of sample divided by the number of moles you have, and then you can rearrange this equation however you need, depending on whether you want to calculate the mass or the number of moles um, given the other. Okay, so, so we have just some basic definitions from, from general, general chemistry uh, that you probably already know. Uh, the next variable that we're going to look at, the volume of a system, the SI unit would be cubic meters uh, and that's typically not very convenient for normal lab work. Uh, rather, instead, we use the liter, or more commonly, the milliliter. And so I've given those conversion factors to you here. Uh, recall that one liter is equal to one cubic decimeter. So the cubic decimeter is equivalent to the liter. Uh, these are the conversion factors that we have. And then uh, another thing to note is that the term cubic centimeter, one cc equals one milliliter. They are the same unit. Uh, the unit of pressure in SI units is the Pascal. Uh, it has, uh, its definition is force per area. And so here it's expressed as Newtons, which is a force per meter squared. Uh, and if you break the Newtons up into its base units, you would get kilograms uh, meters per second squared, uh, kilograms per meter per second squared for the units of uh, pressure. So one Pascal equals one kilogram per meter per second squared. Uh, here I'm just saying, it's basically just stating that uh, when you're talking about absolute pressures, uh, you would report that as P equals zero uh, rather than uh, P equals zero pascals. Uh, very frequently in thermochemistry, we are going to be talking about so-called standard states and standard conditions, and you'll be looking up thermodynamic data that's expressed at standard state. The term standard pressure refers to a pressure of one bar, where one bar is a hundred thousand pascals. So the SI unit of pascal is actually pretty small. Uh, one bar is pretty close to 
uh, one atmosphere. Uh, and here is the unit that you're probably much more familiar with um, from general chemistry. Uh, one atmosphere is 1.01325 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And another unit that you commonly see in gas law problems is the tor. Equivalently, it's called the millimeters of mercury. Uh, you may recall discussing barometers in general chemistry. That's where this um, millimeters of mercury comes from. Uh, and so the conversion between atmospheres and tor involves this 760. I'll note that uh, I, I forgot to mention here that this circle that's what refers to the standard pressure. So whenever you see thermodynamic quantities and they have a little circle above them, uh, that's referring to the standard conditions, standard conditions of one bar. Uh, another important aspect of pressure is that it determines whether or not your system is in mechanical equilibrium with its surroundings. So if you have a, a gas that's in a piston and there's a pressure, let's just call it atmospheric pressure, outside the piston. And then inside the pressure is um, the gas pressure. If the two pressures are not the same, that is if the gas pressure is either larger or smaller than the external pressure, then your system is not in thermal equilibrium with your, is not in mechanical equilibrium with your surroundings. And you're going to find that the, the piston is going to move until the external pressure equals the internal pressure of the gas. And once that's true, then the system will be at equilibrium. So the, the, the pressure variable we associate with mechanical equilibrium uh, involving systems where you have a movable wall, like a piston or a balloon or something like that. Here's a diagram. Uh, illustrating what I just said. So if you've got, here's two subsystems, if they're at equal pressures then this wall is not going to move. If on one side you have high pressure and on the other side low pressure, this wall, if it can move, it will move in this direction until the pressure of this side decreases and the pressure of this side increases until the two pressures are equal and vice versa, going the other direction. Okay, so we associate pressure with mechanical equilibrium. Temperature, which is measured in units of Kelvin uh, in the SI unit system, uh, temperature is related to thermal equilibrium and we talked about that in the previous video so I won't go into any more details on that one. I'll just refer you back to the to the prologue video. When you're talking about absolute zero of temperature you use T equals zero. You don't need to report T equals zero Kelvin. Uh, and the other unit of temperature that you'll frequently encounter is degrees Celsius. And this equation here uh, is used to convert from degrees Celsius to degrees Kelvin. So in order to calculate the temperature in units of Kelvin, you take the temperature in units of Celsius and then you add 273.15. I'm going to do a short problem, which you already know how to do, using this equation just to illustrate how these funny expressions for the units work. Um, it involves unit algebra. Uh, one last point that I wanted to make before we look at that short problem is that there is no microscopic um, way to express pressure and temperature. That is, if you're thinking at the molecular level, you really you don't define temperature and pressure at the molecular level like you would describe mass. Right? You can think of a, a molecule having a particular mass, or you can think of there being a certain number of molecules. However, pressure and temperature variables uh, don't really don't really have a definition until you get to the bulk system and we categorize them as being therefore emergent properties they emerge due to the fact that you have many molecules 
in the same sample. Okay, and that's something unique about, about pressure and temperature. Well, here is that silly problem that I uh, told you about. Uh, simply express uh, 25 degrees Celsius uh, in units of Kelvin. And, and the reason why I'm explicitly doing this problem was, was meant to illustrate how the units work uh, in the equations that you'll be seeing uh, throughout the course. So, so the way that, that Atkins, the author of our, of our textbook, has expressed it, you've got temperature in units of Kelvin is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273.15. And so here what we'll do is we'll plug in for theta, we're going to plug in the 25 degrees Celsius, and what I want you to focus on is the units. So 25.00 degrees Celsius, that's divided by degrees Celsius, plus the 273.15. Okay, you see that the degrees Celsius cancels out, and you're going to get 298.15 with no unit. And that's equal to T divided by Kelvin. The, the, unit of Kelvin is over here on the other side, and you can algebraically move it over to 98.15 Kelvin. So Atkins likes to use a lot of expressions where the units are part of the equation. Okay, I just wanted to show you how, how those work. All right, so think back to your, your Gen Chem days when you did a lot of calculations involving units, or maybe your physics, physics might have been the more recent course that you took. Anyway, so, so I just wanted to show you that. He also will do things like make plots where, I don't know, let's suppose that we're plotting, we're doing a Charles Law plot where you're plotting the volume of a gas in units of liters as a function of temperature in units of Kelvin. And so here along the axis will just be numbers, one, two, three, four, etc. You know, 100, 200, 300, 500, etc going that way. Well, what you're to interpret this, this labeling scheme to mean is that when you have T over K equal to 500, it corresponds to a temperature equal to 500 Kelvin. And so Atkins is, is, is um, he's basically illustrating that this is the proper way to express units in a figure. At least it's one way that you can do it. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, another way of classifying thermodynamic properties is as being either an extensive property or an intensive property. Okay, so we can take our thermodynamic variables and, and characterize them as being either extensive or intensive. Extensive means that that quantity is proportional to the size of the system. As the size of the system gets larger, the value of that quantity will increase. Conversely, you could also be talking about an intensive quantity, one that is independent of the size of the system. And so even though the system would get bigger, the intensive quantity would not change value. And so in this problem, we're being asked to think about the different variables uh, that are listed on this slide, and then characterize them as either being extensive quantities or intensive quantities. And the way that I, I recommend that students do that is they do a little thought experiment where they consider two identical systems that, that they're identical in every way and then think about the quantity of interest, so pressure or volume, whatever it may be, and then imagine combining those two subsystems together to form one total system and then ask yourself, does that quantity change? Does its value increase? So if you double the size of the system, will the quantity also double? Or will it stay the same? If it doubles, then it's an extensive quantity. If it does not double, then it is an intensive quantity. So pressure is the first one on the list. It's actually one of the more difficult ones to think of. Uh, I usually ask a student to visualize two adjacent rooms that are connected by a door that's closed and the air pressure in each room is one atmosphere 
And then if you open the door between the two rooms, ask yourself, will the pressure change? I usually get mixed responses. Some people say it does, other people say that it does not. Uh, the answer is the pressure would not change. If, if the pressure inside the two rooms was each one atmosphere and you open the door, then the pressure would again be one atmosphere. It wouldn't change. So pressure is an example of an intensive quantity. You could do the same, um, the same visualization with volume. So uh, the volume uh, of two rooms, if you, if you add two rooms together, then the volume would also increase, it would double. So volume is an example of an extensive property. Uh, if you think about moles, number of molecules or number of moles, if you um, take a sample of gas and you double the size of the system, well, you're going to end up doubling the number of moles of gas you have. So number of moles is extensive. Temperature is a little bit easier to, to identify than pressure was. Uh, let's suppose you had a glass of water at room temperature and you added it to an identical glass of water that was also at room temperature. You would not expect the temperature to change. And so temperature is another example of an intensive quantity. Number of moles, like mass, is extensive. If you increase the size of the system, its mass will increase. Energy is also like mass in the sense that if you, um, the energy associated with a sample of gas will be doubled if you double the amount of gas in the system. That's one that people are often unsure of. Uh, the way that I help uh, students remember that, I usually ask them to think of the most famous equation in physics and people without a doubt come up with energy equals mc squared. Well, you know that the speed of light in a vacuum is constant. You've established that mass is extensive, then, well, energy should be extensive too. I don't know if this is the formally the most correct way of explaining why energy is extensive, but it usually does the trick. And so you should regard energy as an extensive quantity. Uh, let's look at the next one, and we'll use, uh, we'll use some equations to help us with that one as well. So we'll talk about uh, the mass density next. So the mass density, sometimes people use a D. Uh, very commonly, you'll see the mass density expressed as a rho. Rho equals mass of your sample divided by the volume of the sample. And so the question is, is the mass density intensive or extensive? Well, it's interesting because both components of the density are extensive, right? If you double the size of your system, the mass will double, but the volume will double as well. And so you see that when you take the ratio of two extensive quantities, you get an intensive quantity. So the mass density is intensive. It does not depend upon the size of the system. You're going to find that the number density this funny looking n is also intensive for the same reason. So is the molar mass. Molar mass is intensive. And the molar volume, the volume divided by the number of moles. Uh, the term molar, when used as an adjective in this fashion, almost always means you have an intensive quantity. So for example, molar mass, right? You take the um, mass of your system and you divide it by the number of moles. Both quantities are extensive and the resulting quantity, the molar mass, is intensive. So you can think of molar mass as the intensive version of mass. Likewise, for the molar volume, you take the extensive volume of the system divide it by the number of moles, and that gives you the molar volume. And we usually indicate that it's a molar quantity by, by giving it a little subscript M, so the molar volume. In some, um, in so some authors prefer to use a bar over the top. 
to, def to, to indicate a molar quantity. Uh, we won't be using this notation. Atkins, Atkins seems to prefer this version, and so that's what we're going to use. Uh, but just note that other authors will use uh, an overbar. Uh, you may even find in some of my teaching materials that I may have accidentally used an overbar uh, uh, in them. So expect molar quantities to be intensive. Well, we'll move on to the next, um, the next subtopic, the idea of a perfect gas. And, and it's, uh, let, me, uh, let me frame this. So Atkins, Atkins prefers to use the term perfect gas as opposed to an ideal gas. Uh, and the reason for that is because there's something else in physical chemistry called the ideal solution. And it's, it's advantageous to call the, the ideal gas something other than the ideal gas so that it's not confused with the ideal solution. You are going to catch me probably saying ideal gas all the time, even though Atkins uh, prefers perfect gas. Uh, and that's, that's just because I grew up thinking ideal gas and not perfect gas. But I don't think it makes much of a difference personally. Um, but I've tried to use, uh, be consistent with Atkins' uh, definitions uh, in this in my lecture notes. Uh, but don't be surprised if <laughs> if you find me slipping and saying ideal gas all the time. In any case, the perfect gas is an idealized representation of a real gas, and it has a notably simple equation of state. We've already looked at it: pressure times volume equals number of moles times the molar gas constant times the temperature of the gas. So we see that the four gas variables, pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature, are related to one another through this equation of state. And what I'm highlighting here in the rest of the equation is that you don't necessarily have to use number of moles. If we multiply and divide, um, or, or I should say if we rearrange things a little bit, uh, we, can, we can rearrange the equation to express the, the pressure volume product in terms of number of molecules and a new constant. We've actually looked at it before. This is the Boltzmann constant, again, uh, from the prologue. So you can, in, in, instead of using the gas constant, you can use Boltzmann's constant. The difference being uh, the number of moles versus the number of molecules. So this would be molecules times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, whereas this is number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature. Boltzmann's constant and the gas constant are actually the same thing. They differ merely by um, Avogadro's number. Uh, and so the gas constant is actually equal to Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant uh, here I've expressed it in SI units using the joules per Kelvin per mole. Uh, if you don't want to use the unit of pressure Pascal, if you prefer to use bar, then this is the value of the gas constant expressed in bar liters um, per Kelvin per mole. And then another version of the gas constant that you, you probably actually remember is expressed in liter atmospheres, 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Any version is fine, it just depends on what units you want to use in your problem. And so we'll frequently use this version, sometimes we're going to need the joules version, uh, it really just depends. You use whichever one is most convenient for your problem solving. Uh, at the bottom of the slide here is, is probably one of the most important uh, concepts about ideal gases. Uh, gases exhibit perfect behavior when the temperature of the gas, when the, when the pressure of the gas is very low. Okay? So all gases behave ideally at low pressures. Uh, they also tend to behave ideally at high temperatures as well. 
you can flip that around. So instead of having a low pressure, you could think of the um, gas as behaving ideally when the, molar, when the molar volume is large. Okay. And so let me show you that. So here I'm just taking the PV equals nRT. I'll divide both sides by the number of moles. So that'll give me the molar volume on this side. And then I'll divide both sides by the pressure. It'll give me RT over, over pressure. So when the pressure is very low, so when P tends to zero, the molar volume will get very large. So if you say low pressure, it's the same thing as saying large molar volume. Well, I, I should have left it in the camera view, I guess. So here what we're going to do is use the ideal gas law to derive some of those empirical gas laws that you've studied in general chemistry. Uh, I won't do all of them, I'm just going to do a few. So rather than memorizing all of the empirical gas laws, you can derive whatever you need from the ideal gas law. So one important thing to note is that uh, the ideal gas law is, is used when your gas is not changing states. Right? The ideal gas law is satisfied when the gas is at equilibrium. The empirical gas laws are used for changes of state. So for example, in a Boyle's law problem, pressure and volume are changing, but number of moles and temperature are constant. And so what I recommend that you do is you take all of the quantities um, that are changing and place them on one side of the equation. So the ideal gas law is already set up that way for a Boyle's law problem. Pressure and volume are changing in the problem, but number of moles and temperature are fixed. So this side is a constant. And if one side of an equation is a constant, then the other side must be constant. Now, pressure and volume can change. That is, you can have a pressure and a volume for one state, but the product of pressure and volume must be the same for all states. So that gives you this relationship here. And so a typical Boyle's Law problem would give you um, two pressures and one volume, and they'd ask you to find the final volume. So you can derive it directly from the ideal gas equation. Let's look at a Charles Law example. In Charles Law, the pressure is fixed and the number of moles is fixed, but the volume and the temperature are changing. And so you would put the volume and the temperature on on one side of the equation, and you'd put number of moles, the gas constant, and pressure on the other side. So these are constant, but these are changing. All right. Well, if the whole right-hand side of the equation is a constant, then the left-hand side must be a constant as well. So even though volume and temperature are changing, they're not changing independently of so you'll have volume over temperature equals, uh, for, for one state, must equal the volume and the temperature on the other side. Okay, and so that's the Charles Law equation that you would use. Uh, I'll do this one more time for the um, combined gas law. In the combined gas law, pressure, volume, and temperature are changing. The only thing that's fixed is the number of moles in the gas constant. So you would put PV over T on one side, NR on the other, those are equal to a constant. And so you can write P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. Now, if you were to memorize the empirical gas laws individually, you'd have to memorize Boyle's law, Charles' law, the combined gas law, there's Gay-Lussac's law, Avogadro's law, you know, the number of laws just goes up and up and up. Uh, so you can either do that, or you can just simply remember the ideal gas law, and then be able to figure out how to get the empirical gas law that you need from that. Okay, and so that was the purpose of this, of this exercise, was to show you that you could do that. Uh, well, let's look at some, some graphics here. So in this, in this first graphic, we are, we are essentially depicting Boyle's Law. We're plotting 
the pressure of a gas as a function of volume for fixed values of temperature. Okay, and what you find is this uh, hyperbolic, this hyperbola relationship between the two. We have pressure as a function of volume, and you see that as the volume gets larger, the pressure decreases. And that's, that's fairly intuitive. If you take a balloon, it has a given pressure inside, and if you were to increase the volume of the balloon, you would expect, expect the pressure to drop. You see that at different temperatures, uh, the gas follows different hyperbola, right? So for high temperature, you'd have you'd follow this hyperbola. For a low temperature, you follow you follow this one here. These different curves are called uh, isotherms because everywhere along the curve, the temperature has the same value. Here we're plotting, um, we're plotting this in a slightly different way. We're plotting pressure as a function of one over volume uh, for different values of temperature. Uh, since you're plotting the x-axis as one over volume, you wind up with a linear relationship with the pressure. Uh, in the previous plot, you're plotting pressure directly as a function of volume, and it gives you the um, it gives you these hyperbola. When you do it this way, you get a linear curve. In this slide, we're looking at uh, a Charles Law type of graph. So we're plotting volume as a function of temperature. Charles Law tells us that the temperature, that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the temperature. And so for all of these different pressures, we wind up with these straight lines. So the volume increases uh, linearly as you increase the temperature. Uh, you'll notice that if you, like let's suppose that around here, this was the coldest temperature that we can reach. You'll notice that if you extrapolate all of the lines down to zero volume, they all converge at zero Kelvin. Uh, so this is what we call absolute, absolute zero. And, you know, comparing the temperature in Celsius to the temperature in Kelvin, you find that the T equals zero result corresponds to a uh, temperature in Celsius of minus 273.15 degrees. So we already looked at, at those temperature conversions, but, but anyway, this is, it's this type of graph is how the value of minus 273.15 um, was established. Here, this would be an example of uh, Gay-Lussac's law, where you're plotting pressure as a function of temperature for different values of volume. You find that the pressure of a gas increases linearly as the gas temperature increases, at least for a perfect gas. Uh, in this graphic, what we're doing is we're basically combining the other ones. So here you see we're plotting pressure of gas versus volume of gas versus temperature of gas. And this surface that we're plotting here, notice that along this axis or along this plane, you have this hyperbola shape. Along this direction, you have a linear shape. And along this direction, you have another linear shape. Okay, so you can really think of this as the combination of all of the other graphics that we were looking at. Well, everywhere along the surface, you have a state that satisfies the perfect gas equation of state. Okay, so the surface denotes equilibrium combinations of pressure, volume, and temperature. Any point in space not on that surface is not an equilibrium state of a perfect gas. Here is another uh, view of that same surface with a little bit of extra graphics added in. Uh, this curve right here, this heavy green curve, and this uh, thin blue curve, these are called isotherms because everywhere along the curve the temperature is constant. Um, this red curve here, you see that it's kind of linearly increasing as you go that direction, you know, towards um, 
this would be uh, so, so what you're finding, uh, I, depending on how they're drawing the axis, it may be drawn in a little bit of a funny way, but the point being that everywhere along this curve, the volume has a fixed value. And the term, uh, the term isochoric refers to constant volume. So this type of curve is called an isochore. Uh, the term isobaric means constant pressure. So this curve right here, this uh, teal curve or whatever color that is, it, um, it's called an isobar because everywhere along this curve, the pressure has a fixed value. Well, here we have uh, an ideal gas type of problem. I guess this would be more of an empirical gas, uh, gas law problem. We've got some nitrogen gas in a vessel that has constant volume. It's at a pressure of 100 atmospheres and 300 Kelvin. The gas is heated up to 500 Kelvin. Uh, what would the gas uh, then exert? What would be the pressure of the gas, uh, assuming that it was a perfect gas? Um, and so here we'll go ahead and solve this problem. So again, even if you don't remember any of your empirical gas laws, just take the ideal gas law and ask yourself what variables are constant and what variables are changing in this problem. Take the variables that are changing and put them on one side of the equation, put the variables that are not changing on the other side. Okay? So in this problem, pressure and temperature are changing. So we'll take pressure over temperature and we'll put in R and volume on the other side. Those are equal to a constant. And so then we can write P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. They give us the initial pressure. They give us the initial and final temperature. They want us to find the, the, the pressure, the final pressure. And so we'll just rearrange this. It's going to be T2 over T1 times P1. Our temperatures are already in Kelvin, so we'll just leave them that way. So T2 is 500K, T1 is 300K, times the pressure, initial pressure of 100 atmospheres. So we'll just take 100 times 5 divided by 3, and I'm getting 167. ATMs. And it makes sense. If you heat up a gas at constant volume, the pressure is going to build inside. Okay, so 167. In the follow-up problem, what temperature would result in the same sample exerting a pressure of 300 atmospheres? So here they want us to take P1 to be 100 T1 to be 300, and now they're giving us P2. They're saying P2 is going to be 300 atmospheres. Find T2. So you just rearrange the equation in a different way. So we'll have the 300 ATMs divided by the 100 ATMs. T1 is what? 300 Kelvin. And then we use that to find, to find the final temperature. And so we get 900, 900 Kelvin out of that. Okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here, and we'll pick up with Dalton's law and the rest of the, um, the rest of the section in the in the next video.